My name is Christopher. I'm one of the leaders here at God First. And it's wonderful to know we got the live stream up and running and that you're able to join us at home. Yes, Elliot. Amen. And uh, with so many guests and visitors this morning for the wonderful Zach and Chloe's wedding tomorrow, it is so lovely to all be together. Well, you catch us at a time where we're continuing through our series uh, called Return and Rebuild. And we're asking of the Old Testament books of Ezra and Nehemiah to stir our hearts and to stir a passion for a fight for justice in our areas of influence. So we're going to look this morning, returning and rebuilding God's social justice. My daughter was quite upset when I showed her this, that I was going to say this. Uh, She thinks it's negative. Let's see what you think. A few weeks ago, uh, we as a family were watching an episode of The Chosen. And uh, in it, we follow the story of Simon the Zealot's older brother, who had been a cripple for 38 years uh, since he was a, a young boy. And he'd made his way over those 38 years to Jerusalem. And he was standing, or lying, shall we say, at the pool of Bethesda. And he was waiting for the waters to be stirred, that he might just be healed. And it certainly was a very emotional uh, episode. If you haven't seen any of The Chosen, I can highly commend it to you. Um, But I hadn't realized just how stirring it was until my 10-year-old daughter bursts into tears. The, The fact that Jesus stopped to speak to this nobody who nobody paid attention to and completely ignored, and not only speaks to him, but then heals him. Sorry, is that me? Um, is something that just brought her to tears. She was so heartbroken by the plight of this man, the, the horrors of his life, and then so happy for him when Jesus spoke to him and healed him, raised him up on his feet, told him to go and walk. And she was almost inconsolable for the rest of the episode. But our children are so soft, aren't they? They're empathetic. They've uh, they're so people-focused, and, and I freshly realized out of that uh, incident that as life has had its way with me, I've become cynical, I've become hard-hearted, and my followership of Jesus has become, at times, very functional and cerebral. Allow me to share with you a few of my reflections on why I, and possibly we, as individuals and as a church, know that we should be doing something, but remain stuck in our desire to fight for God's social justice. First point, I don't think I, maybe we, value the soft-hearted people enough. I think we value theology, we value knowledge, we value leadership, we value numbers, we value growing resources. We as a Western culture certainly value hard-heartedness in the sense that, you know, it's business-minded. You know, it's just business. It's economic profit, capitalism, it's dog-eats-dog. And those are the people that we esteem in our culture. So social justice just doesn't tick many of those boxes. Secondly, social justice can be seen, certainly by me, as just a unique spiritual gift. I think because of our kind of Western structural bias with which we read Scripture and find our place in God's big story, we can handle God's heart for justice like other spiritual gifts. You know, some have got the gift of healing, and some have got the gift of prophecy. Well, this one's got the gift of mercy and social justice. You know, the social justice, yeah, that's that group over there. That's their thing. And... I don't always get the fact that God's social justice is at the very heart of the gospel. Thirdly, where on earth would I start, right? There's so much need. There are so many people to help that I suffer from analysis paralysis. You know that one? So I do nothing. And I console myself with the fact that, hey, I'm a leader, I'm going to build the structures 
that allow those with the mercy gift to flourish. And I think that's utter codswallop. I wrote it, that's why I had to say it. It's utter codswallop. And I feel really ashamed of that point, just before God on that. Fourthly and lastly, I, and I think if this one applies to you, you'd already know it and feel it after the things that I've already said. Us middle class Westerners really do not like uh, responding in any way to emotional manipulation. So I think we've got a hardness that's developed, and I, and I want to say in brackets somewhat appropriately, that's developed against things that would steal our time, steal our resources, and divert us from the things that we hold as primary <coughs> importance in our lives. And I think because of the reasons I've mentioned, God's social justice feels like it can come into that little bracket of emotional manipulation. It doesn't affect me. It's not me. It's not my family, as the zombies wrote. The cranberries, sorry, in, in the song Zombie. It's not my problem. And so I don't take it personally, and I do not make it my responsibility. And my prayer this morning is that God would help us to deconstruct the reasons that we give ourselves. That it's okay to shut off at this point in a sermon about God's justice, His social justice, and think, well, it's definitely important for someone in here that someone is just not me. And I want to say to you off the bat, that someone is me. Probably you. And I'm not expecting <laughs> this morning's sermon to bring too many answers. Uh, I think this is too complex uh, to, to do that, but I'm expecting it to stir up more questions for us, questions that only you and I, we, together can answer as we follow Jesus and His heart for all peoples, and when we take it personally. So the danger in using this phrase social justice, as I'm sure many of you have already kind of started twigging, is that we can think about it in the sense that the social justice warriors out there that are fighting for X, Y, and Z, that's not what we're talking about when we talk about God's social justice. There is some overlap, clearly. But in using the phrase, I mean God's justice at a society-wide level. Okay, across all boundaries, His justice reigns. And it's not just the justice that society and the loud voices on the left and the right demand of us. That's not what we're always talking about. So as we read our scriptures this morning, I, I hope it will help define for us a little bit further what we mean when we talk about justice and what we mean as a church when we say we want to be a church that is pursuing God's justice and His social justice for our community. So let's turn to our core scripture. It's Nehemiah chapter 5, and uh, we're reading from verse 1 to 13. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers, for there were those who said, with our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. And there were also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, we have borrowed money for the king's taxes on our fields and our vineyards, yet uh, now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers. Our children are as their children, yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it's not, to, uh, but it's not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. And I was very angry when I heard their outcry in these words. And I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. And I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who've been sold to the nations, but you even sell your brothers that, you may be, that they may be sold to us. They were silent, who could not find a word to say. 
So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards and their houses and the percentage of money, grain, wine and oil that you've been exacting from them. Then they said, we will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the folds of my garment so, and said, may, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. So what's going on here? It's, a, it's an interesting passage. And why does Nehemiah take such strong measures in bringing justice and correcting the injustice of God's people? Well, I think firstly, Nehemiah has called on every able-bodied person in the region to come and work on rebuilding the wall. So people had to literally drop what they were doing. If they were busy harvesting, drop it. If they were working in their fields, um, feeding their livestock, if they were harvesting grain or olives, wines, they had to drop it all and come and work on the wall. And in a subsistence culture, which means grow, eat, or grow, sell, eat, or grow, trade, eat. This is a big problem. And Nehemiah's call to build the wall clearly has put added pressure on a system, on a social system that was sick and crumbling. Then, secondly, there was famine in the land, and things got really, really bad. The people were getting poorer while the governors and the officials were getting richer. Famine means high prices. People in, in Africa know that well. Uh, maybe uh, for us with Brexit having a, a bit of an impact, we're seeing some of the prices going up, supply and demand. So the prices are rising. Poor are selling the things that they have. They're mortgaging their fields to get money for food. They're mortgaging their homes and their fields to pay their taxes. And all of it at a steep interest rate. And it gets so bad that people are selling themselves into indentured service because of their debt. It gets that bad that people are selling their children into indentured service because of their debt. Can you imagine the horror of that? It's not that they love their children any less than we do. Indentured service, which is most often translated slavery in the Old Testament, is when people chose to work for a period of time, or they were forced to work for a period of time for someone else, and that the the, the uh, the earnings of their labors would be deducted against the debt that they owed. So it's just a horrible situation. And shockingly, I think the highlighting that their daughters were being sold uh, and were being given into indentured service probably indicates that sexual abuse was taking place. It's terrible in any culture, but it is particularly heinous when you think this is the people of God doing it to their own people. And another large issue, thirdly, for Nehemiah is that it's a somewhat throwaway phrase, but it definitely sits with him very heavily. The things that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts, taunts of the nations? You see, God's people have become the laughing stock of their political neighborhood. The leaders, the governors, the officials are not acting as they ought. They're not walking in the fear of the Lord. They're not following God's laws and God's ways. And the result, as we see, poverty, greed, famine, and the nations 
that should be drawn to the light of the people of God as they do life in God's best practices are jeering and laughing at the people of God in their darkness. God's glory and His name are being dragged through the mud by the actions of His own people. And Nehemiah is rightly appalled and outraged by this. As should we be. I think as we've heard before in our series, Nehemiah is a passionate man. He feels deeply the heart of God. And he feels deeply the plight of God's people. And because he feels, he takes it personally. And he makes it his responsibility to do something about it. And I love the fact that Nehemiah doesn't just merely give money back and say, okay, poor, there's, you know, sort yourselves out, good luck and God bless. He deals with the poor and he deals with the system. And I think there's something in that for us. I, in our attempts at working into the areas of social justice or God's justice, there will be times when we need to provide for the physical needs of people, yes, and then there will be times when we need to influence, change, and reform broken systems. Even in this, I think there are opportunities for all of us in our different spheres of influence, different gifts, different talents, to use those things for the advance of God's justice. So, where do Nehemiah's corrections come from? Clearly, for a long time now, God's law has not been preached. Sorry, I've got that cable going down my arm. Um, God's laws have not been preached. Um, the Jews have not been reading the Scriptures. And they've not been following God's best practices and His ways. And they've drifted in their knowledge, drifted in their practices to look and smell and sound like all the nations around them instead of the unique people of God. And Nehemiah wants to bring people back to God's law and God's best practices. So let's read some of these now in Deuteronomy 15. And I'll kind of do one, two, skip a few through Deuteronomy 15. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release what he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor, his brother, because the Lord's release has been proclaimed. If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not burden your heart, or harden your heart, sorry, or shut your hand against the poor brother. But you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. For there will never cease to be poor in the land." Really interesting phrase. Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold into indentured service to you, he shall serve you six years, and in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you let him go free, you shall not let him go empty-handed. This is awesome. You shall furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your threshing floor and out of your wine press, as the Lord your God has blessed you, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore I command you this day, so the Lord your God will bless you in all that you do. Isn't that a just ugh, wonderful passage in Deuteronomy? And there is no modern equivalent to what we've just read it just, it makes very little sense to our capitalist Western mindset when we read something like this. But man, does it sound good. It was God's plan that every seventh year, people were fully released from their debt. Isn't that an amazing thought? Set free, sent, and sent away generously if they were in indentured service. Wow. You know, it's not slavery the way we think of slavery when we think uh, Atlantic slave trade. Oh, this is a very different thing that we're talking about here. Every seventh year, God supernaturally 
fed His people because they were not to work the land. They were supposed to be a Sabbath rest for the land. Maybe, just maybe, that's why there was famine in the land. Because they were abusing the land and they weren't allowing it to rest according to God's laws and principles. And every seventh year, God provides for the businessmen and women who were reliant on buying and selling things and even the money lenders. You know, they're not bad. They shouldn't be bad people. They're our friends. They're our neighbors. But they lend money. And then in the seventh year, the debts are written off and they lose out. But God provided for all of these people in a supernatural way. The whole nation experiences the presence and the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Now, there is no direct application in, in our day-to-day -day life other than recognizing that God is passionate for those who have a diminished voice because of their circumstances. God cares deeply for them. And He is unboundingly generous towards them. We need to take note of these things. Listen to this uh, reading where God gives the Israelites a, a command regarding social justice again that Nehemiah no doubt had in mind when he was making his corrections. It's out of Exodus 22. You shall not wrong a sojourner, a foreigner, or oppress him. For you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widows or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn. And I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. Whoa! Are we getting the passion of God yet? As a foreigner, I can tell you, it is exceptionally hard to be in a foreign land. It's hard to get a job. Thank God for Howard and this wonderful church and this team. It's hard. It's hard, hard for my wife. It's just hard. It's hard getting life and friendships going and communities and financial buffers and all. It's hard if you're a foreigner. And it is by the kindness of God's people that foreigners, like me, but in general, and outsiders can settle well amongst God's people and experience God's blessing. And this has been our story time and time and time again. And we are genuinely so grateful for you guys, you church, our friends, our community, who've helped us and supported us. And Howard prompted the question two weeks ago, was Nehemiah right in building a wall to keep outsiders out and insiders in? It's a great question. Because as gospel people, we need to wrestle with this. We get that Jesus came to break down walls and break down cliques and inner circles. Jesus came and he opened up his arms, and he opened up the doors of the kingdom as he offered salvation and love to all peoples. That's why we're here. That's why we're part of the people of God. And in a word, world where only the inner circle crowd was honored in the time of Jesus, the inner crowd was seen or heard, the outsiders flocked to Jesus. People like us, they flocked to Jesus and to his message of grace. God first is, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our G1Cs, on our Sundays, may our arms be open to insiders and outsiders alike. And may God's glory be on display through that action, which is so different to the way the world does it. God First is a great church for new people. I hope you, you, you're seeing that if you're particularly new. If you've been around, hopefully you know that too. You know, we're still growing in this, but I think as a church, we get this deep down. We're not a church with cliques and you know, it just doesn't work in God First. We break down walls. We embrace, open our arms and our hearts and our homes to all sorts. 
regarding the widows, the single mothers, the elderly, the orphans, the ill that are among us. They are at the forefront of God's mind and His heart. Those who've got limited opportunities and limited earning potential. And this was certainly true in the biblical times, but it seems to be equally true and sad reality for many of us today. According to 2020 data, 30% of the children in the UK live in poverty. One in three children you see are dependent on external help so that they do not go hungry every day. <clears throat> of the single parents with children in the UK, 25% of them, one in four, are living in poverty. How many single parents have we got in church? Think about that. Between 5 to 10% of our retired population have worked their entire lives and are now living in poverty. Isn't that just the most desperately sad thing? These are shocking, shocking statistics for a developed nation whose main focus is fast becoming what someone's preferred pronouns are. These are people whom God loves. These are people whom God has a big kingdom purpose for. These are people exactly like you and I, but who are overlooked, disregarded, and ignored by the in crowd. These are the kind of people Jesus had in mind when he launched his public ministry in Luke 4, where he says, the spirit of the Lord, and he was reading out the scroll of Isaiah that Howard is reading out. The spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the year of Jubilee, the year of release, that seventh year where everyone's debts and their houses and their lands and their families get released. Oh, Jesus, what emotions get stirred up in you as we hear these things? What passions are awakened or maybe reawakened that we allow to just go to sleep sometimes? What opportunities did we just not see in the past or we chose not to see in the past or we just ignored that God is making personal again for us. God wants to make it personal that we would explore and make a difference again together. I, lo I love this church. We've got teens in crisis, uh, family space. We've got growing connections with YMCA. We're trusting for good traction with. We are so privileged to have people like Judith Bell and Sarah Avery and Claire Charlesworth and Stella Headley who all work directly with some of these charities. But as they'll tell you, it's never enough. <laughs> it's never enough. Never enough resources, never enough hands, never enough skilled people, and always too many to help. And I personally, I also don't think a building, the building that we're praying for, and I know God will give us, um, which will serve as a community hub, I don't think that's going to be the full answer to our problem. If we don't carry the heart of God into whatever building God gives us, there is no building that will put God's heart into us. Nehemiah's personal example is exemplary. If we'd continue reading in this core chapter of chapter 5 in Nehemiah, we would see that he not only made structural changes to bring people back to God's Word and God's law and God's best practices, but he did everything in his personal power to serve 
the physical needs of people. And it is so stirring. And on the day we walk into our midweek community hub venue that God gives us, what will you be walking in with? What resources, what skills, what hands, what passions? Let me tell you just a few things that I'm stirred by as we consider these things. I'm stirred by the idea of debt counseling happening in our hub, the idea of bereavement groups, addiction groups, adults and computer literacy training, toddler groups, food banks, single mother support groups, minor car services for those who need the support. It's a cool one. I like that. And then lobbying local government, county, whatever, how these government levels work, for structural changes to support these things. We need to do both. It's the left-right jab combo. And I long for the day, God first, when our homes, our places where children are being fostered and we bring them into our homes as we adopt them in to be part of our families. Oh, I pray that the gospel would go out from this church in word and in deed, in power. Do you feel the same? Yeah? In reading through the laws in the first five books of the Old Testament, we get the distinct impression that God hates poverty. God hates poverty the fact that there are widows and there are orphans. He hates the fact that there are people who are considered outsiders and foreigners. But we also get the distinct impression that God is using the fact that we will always have the poor among us and the widows and the orphans and the aliens to remind us of a very deep spiritual truth. It's like in the face of of all the people that fit into this category, when we look into them, it's as if God puts up a mirror. And as we look at them, we see something of ourselves, our spiritual self, our real selves. And as we look in the mirror, I think God says we need to take it personally, like Nehemiah does. It's not a coincidence that every one of the scriptures this morning reminded the Israelites of the fact that God brought them out of poverty, out of slavery, out of being orphans and foreigners in the land of Egypt, and brought them into His land, His kingdom, the promised land. It's a deeply motivating historical and spiritual truth for them and for us. I think as we look in the mirror of people's faces, God shows us that whilst we were yet poor in spirit and could not contribute in any way, Jesus died for us. He paid the price in full for the forgiveness of our sins, that we can be with Him. And whilst there was nothing beautiful or nothing impressive about us, Jesus took us as his beloved bride. That's beautiful. And then he pours on us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And whilst we were spiritual orphans, unwanted, unloved, in Jesus we've been adopted into the family of God. Sons and daughters who now enjoy the full benefits of our eternal inheritance in Christ. Whilst we were foreigners in this faraway land, a land of sin, a land that's far away from God, a land who's filled with death, God called us out. And He transferred us into the kingdom of light and life in His Son, Jesus. Uh, It's as if in the wisdom of God... And I I think this is just so remarkable and wonderful that God knows as fleshly beings, just weak fleshly people, God gives us some 
commands of physical actions that just help us keep grounded in these deep spiritual truths that allow us to keep our followership of Him deeply personal and not cerebral. You know, when Jesus says, be baptized, be submerged underwater, and be, it's the same as being submerged into His Son, Jesus, or into Jesus, and then being w- resurrected in His life. You know, no one will ever forget their baptism. It's cold, it's wet, it's weird. But God gives it to us as an anchor, a physical anchor to our faith. In our communion, like we will do just now, as often as we eat and drink, whenever we get together, we're reminded of the gospel of Jesus, that He loved us so much, and He didn't deserve what came to Him, and we don't deserve what He gives us His body and His blood for the forgiveness of sins. And I would argue that God similarly uses the people around us, like our friends right here in our community, to teach us things. The church community teaches us that for all eternity, we better learn to get along. Because eternity is a long time, and we're going to be together. And we need to learn how to get along in the power of the gospel. We're told to love our enemies. Why is that? Just a random command? No, because as Christ has forgiven us, whilst we were still enemies, we are encouraged. This is the gospel. Go, live it out. Do you see these parallels in the physical with the spiritual truth? Well, I think the poor, the widows, the orphans, and the aliens in our midst, God has them as part, as part of our community, that we would see them and serve them. And as we do so, we see ourselves. We see ourselves. There's a reflection of who we are. And we're moved to action. God knows that we're selfish at heart, which is why He helps us to take it personally, historically and spiritually final question, you know, what would we not do for the person on the other side of the mirror? What would I not do for me? What would you and I not do for God who has saved us from our sin and death, given us an eternal inheritance with Him? And what would you and I not do for others to experience that same connection, life, joy, and peace as we enjoy. In saving us, God made the lives of others our personal responsibility. And so I look forward to doing this with you. So let's close our eyes. We're going to have a, a, a time of just a song of reflection that we can sing some of these truths, but church, we don't want to walk out here, see ourselves in the mirror, and be like men and women who forget what we've seen. When we look in the mirror of the truth of who we are actually, we're poor, we're ashamed, we're alone, Without Christ, there is nothing impressive or good or just about us. God, in His kindness, allows us to have these physical imagers around us to help inspire, remind us of who we are, who He is, who one another are. So as we sing now, let's reflect on the truths we're going to sing in the song. Reflect on the spurring of God in our hearts, the stirring to action, taking it personally. And then we'll break bread after.